Hello world! In today's video, we are going to understand the Bluetooth low energy related concepts and this is part 1 of a two part series. Now I'll try to explain everything that is required to get you quickly started in implementing some real world examples using BLE. So first of all, let's warm up a little bit before we dive deep into say some serious terminology. Now, did you know that Bluetooth technology was named after a Danish king, King Harald Bladen, or I think it's Bluetooth in English. I think he had a strong liking towards blueberries or had a dead tooth, which was blue in color. <laughs> These are just speculations. The point is that he was known for unifying the warring factions of what is present day Denmark, Sweden and Norway. Interestingly, uniting devices from different manufacturers with different purposes is what Bluetooth technology is all about. In the mid-1990s, numerous corporations were developing competing non-compatible standards. This growing fragmentation was obviously an impediment to widespread adoption of wireless technology. Thus, Bluetooth an industry-wide standard was developed for low-power and short-range radio connectivity. And by the way, the logo of Bluetooth is a combination of the letters H and B, which are the initials of King Harald Bluetooth in runic script, which was used by the Vikings, which I think is pretty interesting. Enough of history, now let's straight away shift our focus on Bluetooth low energy. It is also referred to as Bluetooth Smart and it is a lightweight subset of classic Bluetooth. It was introduced in 2010 to enable the growth of low power applications under the umbrella of IoT with specific target being the devices that are run on tiny source of power like coin size batteries. It allows you to send short bursts of data with connection intervals spread as far apart as possible to save battery life. Even though BLE is relatively young, it has been rapidly adopted by major mobile industry giants. Hence, a product developed with BLE configuration will only result in a wider acceptability in the market. Now, let's jump into the technical aspects of BLE. Let's have a look at the BLE protocol stack. But hang on, what is protocol? A protocol is a universally agreed way to communicate between two devices and a protocol stack is nothing but a set of protocols that work together to transmit information from one BLE device to another. Now each layer in the stack has the illusion that it is communicating with the equivalent layer on the other BLE device, but in fact it is communicating with the layers above it and below it in the stack. Mm, what do we mean by that? Let us consider an analogy where President Trump of USA is, say, talking to Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia. Now, President Trump speaks English and Putin speaks Russian. Well, he might speak English as well, but let's pretend that he doesn't. So, Trump says something in English looking at Putin, but in fact, he's speaking to a translator. The translator translates what he says into Russian. Putin replies in Russian, looking at Trump, but in fact, he's speaking to a translator. So I hope that makes sense now. So with that understanding, now let's have a quick look at the first layer of the stack, which is the physical layer. Now, as the name says, it contains the analog communications circuitry. It is concerned with the actual transfer of data over air via radio. BLE operates in 2.4 GHz ISM, which is Industrial, Scientific and Medical Band. It is a license-free band that is used for short-range applications. All versions of BLE modulate the 2.4 GHz carrier using GFSK modulation technique. Now, out of the total 40 channels, each with a bandwidth of 2 MHz, Three are used by BLE for advertising and the rest 37 are used as data channels. But what is advertisement? Well, it is when one BLE device, say peripheral, is shouting about its presence on those three channels that we just discussed 
And if, say, any other device, say central, is interested in exchange of data, then it will be exchanged on those 37 channels using something called as frequency hop mechanism. And this mechanism helps in avoiding interference with other signals, such as Wi-Fi, which are on the same ISM band, that is 2.4 gigahertz. Next is the link layer. Unlike the physical layer, this one is usually implemented as a combination of hardware and software. It is responsible for advertising, scanning, and for creating and maintaining connections. It provides first level of control and data structure over the raw radio operations. So here you will get to see a packet structure. Now, as an application developer, you don't need to understand the details of this layer. Together, the link and physical layer form the controller layer. In a nutshell, the layers that we will discuss now will be host layers, and the host is concerned with simply pouring the data in and pulling it out. But the controller layer controls the radio and maps the connection requests from the higher layers onto the physical time slots on RF. So what do we mean by all of this? To put it simply, host is interested in, say, throwing a party, which is exchanging the data. And controller does the dirty job of actually moving it. Now, first layer in host is the L2 cap. L2 cap stands for Logical Link Control and Adaptation Protocol. It provides data encapsulation services to the upper layers. This is the layer that is responsible for data integrity. Thus, in case a packet does not reach the destination, then this layer ensures retransmission. Now, retransmission is true only for data that is transferred post an establishment of a connection between two BLE devices. Well, there is no need to retransmit an advertisement packet anyway. So this layer deals with connection-oriented data. Next is SMP layer. SMP stands for Security Manager Protocol. And as the name implies, this one provides services to other stack layers for two things, a secure connection and a secure exchange of data between two BLE devices. So it's got all everything to do with security. Then there is a layer that comes in between our host and controller layers, that is the HCI or host controller interface. Now the host doesn't get to directly change or edit the settings in the controller. Thus, there is a mediation layer known as HCI. HCI allows interoperability between the host and controller, as simple as that. Finally comes the application layer. The user application sits here and directly interacts with the BLE stack without getting into the nitty gritties of the layers below. So that's about the stack. But what about these three layers which we haven't talked about yet? So the concepts related to these layers are the most important ones in BLE. So we will address each one of them in a detailed manner. And that will be covered in the second part of this two part series on BLE fundamentals. Make sure that you have subscribed to the channel and do drop a like. And I'll see you next time. Bye world.